introduction to derivatives and insight into the quadrillion dollar industry organized by the NUS Investment Society. My name is Shakir and I will be doing this presentation with two of my partners, Chen Chen and the team. Before we begin, we'll have to release some disclaimer with regards to the workshop. Did I meeting? Okay, let's take it. Now, uh, before we begin, uh, Palmer, I would like to ask some questions to the audience. Uh, who here knows about the of this? Show of hands. Not a lot of people. Okay. Uh, anyone, I suspect that nobody knows how some of them work or familiar with the like options, features, swaps. Okay, that's good. Uh, because the workshop today isn't so much for the experienced ones. This is, of course, just merely an introduction. We can't cover very quickly, uh, within just 40 to 45 minutes. So we streamline our presentation to just three things. We shall eliminate what derivatives are in general, firstly, and what they do. Then, we shall touch upon the basics of the four typical derivative instruments, of which the first and second will be covered by teacher on uh, forward and future contracts. The third instrument will be covered by Tsuchin over here on swaps. And I will be covering on options as well as some pointers on how to trade options as a retailer. Now, we assume that you have some financial background to be able to understand the contents of this workshop. If you have gone to the previous workshops run by the investment society, you should be fine. Otherwise, these are the three things that you would need to understand. Uh, firstly, uh, you would need to have some basic financial literacy. And the second one is the concept of discounting and compounding. Both are actually the same thing. Well, with that, let's begin. So, what are the this? I'm pretty sure that's the question most of you have when you choose to join in this workshop. Let's start with the basic concept. Now, we have two pictures here, an orange and an orange juice. So what's the relationship between the orange and the orange juice? Orange juice is a derivative of oranges because it derives from the orange that has been squeezed up to become orange juice. Uh, another example would be this. Uh, anybody here beats Pen fiction of any kind? Okay. Pen fiction can be said to be a derivative of the official source of the film. And since it is based and derives from the settings of the same film. This is also true with regards to the financial instrument, the value and price of the derivatives which in this case refers to options, futures, and swaps, are determined and derived from the value and price of the underlying assets, which are stocks, bonds, commodities, real estate, etc. Now, this slide is to give a perspective on how big the derivative is, the derivative market is, as compared to the rest of the securities. I won't touch upon the debate whether the this market will include the power market, market which are gold and silver, which uh, when the economic crisis happens, because this will take a very, very long time to explain, to discuss, some of which will call it as conspiracy theories, yada, yada, yada. This is just for comparison's sake between the market value of various securities. So, why do people and institutions trade derivatives. There are many reasons, but I will touch upon the two which I believe to be the main ones. Now, we can categorize the market conditions of any particular asset into four main types between trend and volatility. As you can see here. The derivatives are mainly used to hedge against volatility. So they are very useful in trading the change of volatility over time and even more useful in aging markets where one can earn money through the selling of premiums. What are premiums you ask? I will touch on it. Food. The 
The second is the flexibility of using derivatives as compared to assets such as real estate or even commodities. You will only need a fraction of the funds needed to pay similar returns as compared to the underlying assets by making trades on margin. Some of you might actually heard it as the term leverage. Now, Cheng Cheng will continue this workshop with the first and the second derivatives which are futures and forward contracts. Uh, so now I'll just explain the concept of forward and future contracts. Uh, in fact, these two uh, types of derivatives are very uh, similar concepts and that's why people often bring them together. And they're also the simpler ones uh, in the sense that we have to understand these two concepts in order to move on to the other derivatives. Okay, so let's first take a look at the official definition of a forward contract. So a forward contract is a customized contract between two parties to buy or sell an asset at a, at a specified price on a future date. So we'll break it down into different components. So firstly, it's an obligation to buy or sell something. And then there's the specified time and a specified price. Um, uh, for this point, uh, after this, uh, for forwards and future contracts, they're different uh, in the sense that forward contracts are customizable and future contracts are standardized. So for now, you might not be able to understand these characteristics, but just uh, we'll come back to it in a, in a moment's time. Okay, so I'll, I'll now use a hypothetical example, a scenario to illustrate how um, how this uh, future futures contract and forward works in practice. So here's the scenario. So every year, this, this mango farmer produces 10,000 kilograms of mangoes, but uh, he has a problem because uh, the price of mango always fluctuates, and sometimes it goes as high as 150, sometimes it goes down to $1 per kilo, and uh, he's not able to make a steady income. And on the other, other side of the equation, you have this dessert chain who, who specializes in making mango puddings, and, and when the price of mango increases, they, uh, they cannot cover their cost, and when the price decreases, uh, they cannot make profit. So either party likes the situation very much. Um, so they don't like the unpredictability of one year having a feast and another year uh, possibly having a famine. So uh, in order to avoid this situation, what they can do is uh, they agree ahead of time um, and to transact at a, at a specified, uh, regardless, of, of the, regardless of the future market price, they agree to transact at a specified price. Uh, let's say uh, that in this way, uh, it's good for the dessert chain because uh, they can now have a decent profit and it's also good for the farmers and they are able to cover their costs and pay, pay the bills as well. So uh, what they have set up here, uh, the 10,000 kilos of mangoes for delivery on the 18th of January, that's the, which is the specified date, uh, this is what we call a forward contract. Right, so what it, what it is is essentially an agreement and it's an obligation for the two parties to transact in the future uh, at a specified price. So on the 18th of January, the, the farmer is obligated to, to produce his 10,000 kilograms of mangoes and the dessert chain is obligated to produce the money, which is essentially $12,000. So as a result, they are both able to avoid the volatility and to make sure that they can profit. So, but uh, a few, they might have some concerns, a few uh, problems might arise because uh, one is that what if the other party is not able to up uphold their end of the contract? Uh, this is known as the counterparty risk. So essentially, the counterparty to the mango farmer is the dessert chain and the counterparty to the dessert chain is the mango farmer. So. Uh, they, are, they are afraid that the other party might not be able to uphold their end of the contract. The other concern is that they might have some second thoughts about this contract. Um, what would they be able to sell the obligation? Uh, what if the dessert chain stop making mango pudding and start making some other dessert, uh, like durian puffs and stuff? So would they be able to trade this forward contract? And, um, uh, and there's another issue. Even if they are able to trade, um, we cannot ensure that the other might want the contract of the same size. So what if they don't want 10,000 kilos? Uh, what if they want to deal with, uh, with a smaller quantity? So that's when the exchange comes into play. And uh, what they do is, 
the exchange will create a bunch of contracts that, that and standardize them. So let's say uh, 100 kilos of mangoes, which is a small amount for delivery on the 18th January. And essentially, the exchange is taking up all the counterparty risk to, to make people more comfortable with trading. So they are able to guarantee that these trades get uh, delivered, uh, get settled on the delivery date. Uh, so uh, all of a sudden, uh, these guys don't have to trade this, do this one-off contract. Uh, they are, they are standardized, standardizing contracts. Uh, the exchange can now trade. And just uh, the smaller farmers, like farmers A, B, C, can now trade with customer A, B, C, where where they can agree at a at a fixed price, where they can do smaller increments in terms of quantity. So if anyone of them want to get out of the trade, they can they can just uh, do so by sending them off to another person on the exchange. Uh, so these standardized contracts, uh, just look at the middle part, uh, is essentially what we call the future contracts. Yeah. So uh, these contracts are essentially the same thing as the forward contracts that we discussed just now, except that they are not standardized. Uh, they are agreed. Uh, it's a agreement to transact at a at a future date for a certain amount of money for a certain amount of something else. Uh, it could be mangoes here, uh, but it could also be a security like stock. Uh, it could also be a precious metal like uh, gold or silver. Uh, so these are called futures where they are standardized and they are now traded in an exchange. Okay, so now you might be wondering why the exchange is willing to take up all the counterparty risk uh, for people to exchange these standardized future contracts. The first reason is that the exchange actually uh, stands to gain a lot of profit. So uh, what they do is they, they tell the people who want to deliver the mangoes to uh, deliver at a price of $120 and tell the people who wants to buy mangoes to enter the market uh, with a settlement price of $125 per kilo. So in this way, uh, essentially when the settlement occurs, he would be able to make a profit of $0.05 cents per kilo. Um, and on the on future contract of 100, 100 kilograms, uh, the exchange would be able to make uh, $1, uh, no sorry, $5 per math. Per, per contract. So if they're able to, the, this five dollars is what we call the spread. Uh, if they're able to maintain the spread, the exchange would be able to make uh, five dollars profit every time one of these future futures contract exchange ends. Right. So uh, the other way the exchange protect itself from against the losses is to make each of these parties set aside a certain amount of money in the future uh, in their, what they call the margin account. So, uh, and this money is set aside uh, in order to cover the unexpected change of price. Uh, so the exchange has, uh, has a cushion, so we can actually use the margin as the, as the uh, insurance against uh, the change in market price. So let's now take a look at the futures, uh, the futures uh, margin mechanics. So uh, let's say the terms of the contract is the same. It's still 100 kilo, kilo of mangoes for delivery on the 18th of January. Uh, so uh, I have, and just take a look at the top left hand corner, the initial margin of $10 and maintenance margin of $5. So you might not know what this means, but we'll come back to this in a, in a second time. So uh, let's say the delivery price of the contract is $120. Uh, so that's 120 for uh, 100 kilo of mangoes on the 18th of January. Uh, but let's say the next day, between two other parties, the same trades occur and uh, the same contract, they trade the same contract for uh, $115. Now, uh, the customer A is not very happy. He, he is not making the best decision for himself because um, he's sort of worse off than the people participating in the futures market today. Uh, but the farmer is very satisfied because he's better off than the, those people who is participating in the market today. So um, uh, the exchange is afraid that the customer might not be, uh, might, might not want to put up the money anymore. Uh, he can just enter another futures contract with another party at a lower price. So what they do is they take out five dollars from the margin account of the customer and put it into the account of the mango farmer. So now you see they uh, they also adjust the delivery price. So now the price is the same, and uh, the mango farmer is compensated 
uh, by getting five dollars immediately. So, um, so let's say uh, for the next day the price goes down again to one to one uh, one hundred and thirteen dollars, and the same process will go through the same process, and uh, the customer the margin account of the customer increase to three dollars, and that of the mango farmer increase to seventeen dollars. And now we, we realize the customer's margin account actually goes below the below the maintenance margin of five dollars. So that's when uh, the customer, the exchange will demand the customer to to put up another seven dollars and top the top up the margin account back to ten dollars. Yeah. So that's how the change occur, and that's how the exchange make use of margins to to protect itself from the counterparty risk. Uh, however, the uh, margin leads to, leads to very high leverage. So when the market price changes, the margin amount varies to a much greater proportion. So we can see that when the when the delivery price decreased from 120 to 115, the margin account de uh, decreased by about 50 percent. So essentially, the market price changes by less than five percent, which leads to a change of the investment by 50 percent. Uh, so that's uh, such is the high leverage of the of the future market, which allows traders to use a small amount of capital to control a uh, control an investment of much greater value. Yeah. So now we are more or less familiar with the concept of forward and future. So uh, to sum up, both contracts are obligations essentially to buy something uh, at a specified price in a future specified date. Uh, but they have differences. A forward contract is traded over the counter. That means. Uh, that means the contract are traded in a decentralized market, and whereas the futures contract are always traded in an organized commodity exchange. Uh, so it's exchange traded. Uh, the futures contracts are standardized contracts in, term, uh, in smaller quantities, uh, where all the uh, the terms of the contracts are standardized, like the uh, commodity grade, the place of transaction, the time of transaction are all standardized, but uh, the terms of the forward contracts are completely subject to the negotiation between the buyers and the, side of the sellers. Uh, and also, uh, forward contracts almost always end up in delivery, that means the goods get delivered from place A to place B, and the money gets uh, exchanged. Uh, this, um, yeah, so the buyer must produce the actual money to buy the goods. Uh, however, for futures contracts, rarely they rarely end up in delivery. So, which means that um, the traders prefer to close up the uh, the, the futures uh, the futures contract before it end, it reach the settlement date. So, what they do is uh, they usually enters into an opposite position. The same trader into an opposite position, so that the contract is sort of neutralized. Yeah. So that's all. Uh, pretty much all for forward and futures contract. Uh, with these two uh, basic uh, basic derivatives, uh, we will use them, the concept of these two as the foundation for uh, the swap derivative. So I'll pass the time on to Zexin. I will keep the man simple. Uh, for swaps, uh, this English word stands for the action of the changing of items. Uh, as suggested by this diagram, and also as the financial derivative which um, officially is an agreement between two other parties to exchange cash flows in the future according to a predetermined set formulation of a futures, which is to exchange, uh, to exchange, uh, to buy or sell an asset. But this, the difference is the, the exchange is cash flows. What we exchange is cash flows, a series of, uh, a series of items. So we are going to give a general example of the contract. So A will be obliged to give B something, something for appearance. And B will be obliged to give something back to A. So the third sentence stands for the meaning of the predetermined predetermined uh, predetermined formulation of the swap contract, which is uh, both items exchanging between A and B should be considered to have equal value at the beginning. That means at the, at, the point, at the point of time when we sign a contract, we should expect them to have the same value in the future. But it's probable, of course, it, it is probable when uh, time goes by, the, in the future they have different values. So uh, let's give a more, even more simple uh, example for, for the formulation of swap contract. So suppose that we expect the future interest rate to be flat 
that needs to be constant for three, at three percent for the coming uh, for the coming three years. So, in the as specified in the contract, A will pay, A will pay B the spot interest rate times one thousand each month, and B will pay A a fixed rate of three percent times one thousand, at the which is thirty dollars per month. Let's 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 say if everything goes by our expectation, uh, so these payments will be exactly equal and. And we expect A and B to pay nothing to each other. But it's also probable that the market will fluctuate and we will have uh, the interest rate will vary and the, the contract will become more beneficial to A or B. So uh, the, the first difference between swap and futures is that swap can be considered a series of futures. The idea of a series is that. Um, well, I believe most of you know what is a coupon bond. So let's say we have a coupon bond of uh, face value 1,000 and a maturity of 5 years and coupon rate of 2%. Annual coupon. So we expect to receive $20 per year for the first year, for the four, first four years and to receive $1,020 at the end at the end of five years. So we can break this uh, break this coupon bond into five zero coupon, which is uh, which are four. Uh, which are four, uh, one, two, one year to four year, uh, ten dollar face value zero point one, and uh, five year one dollar twenty. So similar to that, uh, if you consider Chen Chen's mango as, uh, if you consider Chen Chen's mango as one hundred one hundred dollar US dollars, then you can think of this as a future. Well, this is this is a basic currency. Future. Uh, in the, in, at the maturity, you will be exchanging uh, 100, 140 Singapore dollars for 100 US dollars. So, for a swap, you will be exchanging per period 140 Singapore dollars for 100 US dollars. I put the I put the, uh, the quotation marks around currency swap because this is not exactly a currency swap. This is a swap contract contract to exchange. <coughs> Currency based on a uh, uh, specified date and, and, and value, but it's not exactly uh, the official term for official term for currency swap, which I will explain later. And the second the second difference is that swap can only be traded by institutions because swaps are particularly large in value and uh, they are not they are they cannot be traded in exchanges because exchange will bear the reason the reason is that exchange will bear the default risk. For the counterparty, that means if your counterparty default, exchange exchange will suffer the loss for your counterparty. But in the case that swaps are traded in the in the exchanges, if the if one party of the one party of the swap default, the exchange the the loss bearer by the exchange can may cause the exchange to default. When it, when in the case that the exchanges default, all the traders suffer. So that's a, that is not desirable. So we don't do that. So swaps are not uh, traded in. They are usually traded in policies. So three main three main types of swaps are currency swap, commodity swap, and interest rate swaps. So this is uh, a f official currency swap, which is um, for this kind of situations that A and B are both multinational companies and they have their specialties in Singapore and USA. Let's say A is A is more competitive in USA and B is more competitive. So how how does this how is this show? So A has a A has a higher um, A has a lower borrowing rate in Singapore, and B has a lower borrowing rate in uh, in, in US the uh, USA. But A will want to have a lower in USD, and B will want to want to have a lower in Singapore dollars. So in this case, they are going to negotiate with the bank to make a contract which is both beneficial to them and. The bank. This is one formulation of the contract. This is one only one formulation of the contract because there are many possible possibilities, and this is uh, this is the one that is beneficial for three of them. If you look at A only, A is paying a US dollar, a US dollar of five percent, which is which is five zero point five percent lower than its foreign rate, and B is paying a. Uh, Singapore dollar of 6.5%, which is 0.5% lower than 
Singapore dollar point rate. And the bank is paying 1.1% in US dollars and receiving 2.5% in Singapore dollars. So the bank is earning 1.5%. But the bank is the only one bearing the foreign exchange, foreign exchange rate. Now we come to commodity swaps. So uh, some, some companies, maybe power companies, they bear the risk in the price of the goods that they purchase. Um, for example, power companies will be able to purchase the electricity. And if the price of the electricity vary, they may not be able to pay a fixed, uh, they may not, may not be able to receive a fixed income. And therefore, cannot, cannot, cannot pay the fixed salary for the employee. For so this is not desirable. So commodity swap is a tool for them to lock in the price of the goods they purchase or sell. So um, let's say company ABC want to uh, have the need to buy one ton of silver each month from the spot commodity market. And and there's a there's a very nice swap counterparty, maybe a bank, which which is willing to help them in the way that the bank. The bank will be paying will be, pay, will be paying the company ABC a payment which is based on the spot spot market rate for the silver. And the market and, and this payment will be used by the company ABC to pay for the spot market. The company ABC just pay the fixed payment which is determined if when we when the when the bank and the, and the company ABC sign a contract to to the so in conclusion, they just, uh, the company ABC is paying fixed payments to exchange for the commodity, which is the silver. How do we determine the price of the commodity? How do we determine the uh, price of the swap? We follow one, one principle as I uh, introduced during the definition for the swap. Uh, they both items should have the same value at the beginning. This is Tom Max. Do you already want to see this? Uh, maybe I can tell this back very clearly. So you uh, need to understand understand all the all the terms. So N I is the amount required at at time I. That means that means the terms of silver you need at time I. So D zero I stands for the discount factor at from time zero to time I. You know what, if you know what, what is something, you should know what is discount, discount factor. That means if you are using a, if you are using a one, one year compounding rate, compounding interest rate of uh, of of one one percent, the discount factor is one point zero one to to how many one. Okay. Uh, maybe we are running out of time, so I'll just skip this up. So interest rate swaps is the third type of uh, swaps for for risk loving party and the risk averse party. The risk loving party will be receiving a float rate uh, in exchange for a fixed rate. And vice versa for the risk averse party. So why do they why do they want to do that? Because some party want to have want to have a fixed rate in order to pay their as a fixed income tax or fixed salary, and the other party may want to have uh, enjoy a higher expected rate of return in exchange for in exchange for higher higher risk. So one term you may not understand is the LIBOR, which is the London Interbank Overnight Rate. So LIBOR stand in this case LIBOR stand for the spot in market rate for interest rate. Now, let's talk about the last of the derivative instruments in this workshop, options. So, does any one of you have heard of this term or seen this contract before? I'm putting this here in this slide to show that the options, options are pretty common. You'll have to take part in an option purchase agreement to purchase your own housing property in Singapore. In this case, you will need to pay a premium to purchase a right to buy a property, usually $1,000 in order to choke the property while the eventual owner gets the funds to finance the house. 
So now let's proceed on to the official definition. An option is a financial derivative that represents a contract sold by one party referred to that referred to as the option writer to another party which referred to as the option holder. The contract offers the buyer the right but not the obligation to buy or sell a security or other financial asset agreed upon by during a certain period of time or on a specific date. Okay, that's a long definition. Let's break it down to something more understandable. So basically, an option contract gives the buyer of the contract the right to buy or sell the underlying asset by a specified time, which is referred to the, as the expiration date, and at a specified price, which is referred to as the strike price. Other ways to define or classify an option include whether it is an American, European, or Bermudan option, whether you want to get the right to buy or to sell the asset, the option itself, or whether you want to take a spec price which is out of the money, in the money, or at the money. Now, with this concept will be explained in the following slides, and also be better understood in the option chain, which will be shown later. So, there are three main option types or modes, as I would call it. They are American, European, and Bermudian options. As you would have guessed for the flags. Well, maybe not for the Bermudian flag. Anyways, the difference between the three modes of options is the execution in exercising the option contract. The American contract is as free as the American people. Not as exactly. Which, but then again, which allows you to exercise the options at any point of time up to the expiration date. For the European options, they are more traditional, such that you can only exercise the option on the expiration date itself. As for the Bermudan options, it's a hybrid between the two options. You can only exercise it at a specified time leading up to the expiration date. Now, in this workshop, I will only refer to the American options simply because they are more liquid than the other two uh, due to the size of the US markets, US equities. Now, uh, can you tell me the contract terms get the right to buy or to sell the underlying asset? Actually, yes, this does not mean I'm sure you would know from this slide first that they are called call and put options. A call option is a contract that gives you the right to buy an underlying asset at a price you specify as a spike price. A put option, on the other hand, gives you the right to sell the underlying asset. Also, there are three main types of strike prices. In the money, at the money, and out of the money. In the money would mean that you exercise the contract. If you exercise the contract immediately, you will gain the profit, assuming there is no premium attached to the contract. Add the money would mean that you are at or very near to the current market price of the underlying asset. This refers to the spike price itself. Out of the money is opposite of in the money, which means that you would have to wait for the price to move into your favor before you can exercise the option at a profit. Now, I did say that you will profit by on an in the money spike price, provided there is little to no premium attached. But that is not the case in real life. Usually the, price, the premium price will be expensive enough such that you will incur a loss should you immediately exercise the option. Now, let's move on to the option chain for more elaboration. elaboration. So, this is a typical option chain that you will see when you are buying or selling options. The middle part here, 20, 22.5, 25, 30, 25, so on and so forth, is the strike price. To the left, you will see the call option details being asked for the open first. And on the, on the right, you will see the put option details. Also, there is a current price at the top of the spec price chain. Over there, there's the M3773. 3773 is the uh, current price at the point of time. And over there, to the left, you can see the time left to expiration. Now let's make it up to simple, uh, simple parts. As you can see, the spike price are categorized as such. 
where you can see the in, in the money calls will be on the left hand side and in the money calls will be the bottom left side and vice versa for the all the money. The at the money is at the line uh, between the boundary between the in the money and all the money. Uh, so you can see that the in the money premiums are much more expensive than out the money premiums. Uh, you can see 17, 14, 12 as compared to even uh, 5 cents. You can actually get it for 5 cents for all the money prices. You will see why in the following slide. Now, this strategy that I will be sharing to you will be very simple and, but you should make your own research to come up with your own strategy if you wish to delve into options trading. Uh, but intuitively, this is how you make money in options. So if you buy a call option, you are expecting that the premium plus the strike price will be smaller than the eventual price, so long as you exercise it before the expiration date. Vice versa for selling calls. On the other hand, if you buy a good option, you are expecting the strike price to be greater than the premium and the eventual price. The sum of it, sum of it. Vice versa for selling calls. Selling puts, sorry. You can pretty much categorize them to this as well. So if you are bullish on a particular asset, you will buy call and sell call. Being bearish on the other hand would mean that you will sell call and buy call. Now, I did say earlier that for derivatives, you would look at volatility more often than not than the trend, and that is still true. Even as you categorize the buying and selling of calls and goods as such, one thing is true most of the time. As the volatility increases, so does the premium. Why? Remember that the main function of derivative instruments are to hedge against volatility. So as volatility increases, so does the demand for those instruments to be put into play, thus increasing the price of the premiums. So in regards to volatilities, there are many ways to watch the volatility of assets, some of which are the average true range indicators, Volatility channels on the other type of sense. And for US equities, there is the mix or the volatility index as shown on the slide. This shows the volatility index for the past five years, the mix. There is a rule of thumb for those who use the mix. If the index is below 20, it means that the market is not so volatile and options will be priced normally. If it is above 20, however, it shows the high market uncertainty the high volatility and options tend to be more expensive. Now pulling the chart all the way back to 1990, you can see that the spikes correspond to major issues, major events, which is in this chart, the greatest spike, as you can see over there, 89.5, if I'm not mistaken, coincides with the 2008 financial crash. So here we have the S&P 500, as compared to the mix for 2016. As you can see, or can't see since it's pretty small, notable spikes in the, the low price of good oil in the beginning of the year. And then you can see this that spike over there, Brexit in June. And then there's this spike, which is the Trump victory in November. Now, before we end, I would like to talk a bit about binary options. To me, a better way to describe what binary options are is that they are in fact derivatives of options, not options themselves. They are popped up for the most part to create liquidity for junk options that are set to new soon. Also, there are these to reward ratio is mostly less than one. So for the most part, you must have a high rate or you will lose in the long run. I will not touch much on them, uh, but if you ask me if I recommend them, my answer is no. Unless you fancy gambling as part of your investment system. And with that, I thank you for attending this workshop.